We've been moving through the book of Ephesians in our message time, and today when we come into uh, the latter part of the second chapter, we're going to focus on an idea that's there, an idea that is called family. So what is family? We can think of family in many ways, kids, can't we? You got a brother out there? You got a sister out there? Yeah, everybody, I suppose, got a mother or a father somewhere, you know, with the Lord or perhaps still with you if you're blessed. Family. Sometimes in family, we don't always get along the best, right? But that doesn't change the fact that we are family, right? And when we think about family, oh, yeah, I don't want to forget the picture I brought. Right. Oh, this is my family in day gone by, probably almost 20 years ago. I didn't have a recent big enough picture of them, but um, there's my son Dan and my daughter Beth and uh, my daughter Carrie and my daughter Chrissy and my daughter Emily over here. And of course these two people, well you might not recognize us now. My hair was a lot darker then and my glasses were a lot bigger. Uh, it was the style at the time, not the hair, the glasses. I can't help the fact that the gray is coming out. Linda hasn't changed very much at all. Uh, her smile's as beautiful as ever. Anyway, you no doubt have pictures like this on your walls at home, don't you? Right? Family. We put their pictures up so we will be reminded about them. Uh, and when we see the pictures, it brings a smile to our face. Like this picture, oh no, this is not the one. There's an earlier picture that has memories in it. Every picture has some sort of memory of the occasion whenever it was taken. So family, we've shared life together. That partly defines family, doesn't it? And you know, I want to suggest to you, although often we think about family by biology, okay, that is, is that our genetics, you know, but really family's more than that biology, isn't it? It's much more than the genetic side of things. It's much more really even than all the experiences that we have shared together. If I was to think about what is the essence of your family and my family, now, sadly, not every family has this experience, but when a family is what I believe God wants it to be, there is one quality, there is one characteristic, there is one thing that just identifies or uh, characterizes a family. I think you already know. It's love, isn't it? Love. Like I said, we don't always agree in our families. That happens because of our humanness, I suppose, but it doesn't change the fact that we're family, and it doesn't change the fact that love is still the binding ingredient in our families. Our love for our brother, our sister, our mother, our father. And that in our earthly family, but as I think about the family we're going to talk about today, it's our church family too, right? And what is the binding characteristic of God's family? Is it not supposed to be? Should it not be? Is it not that element of love? Herein is love that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. He first demonstrated that love to us by giving himself for us. And you remember what Jesus said? Everybody will know you're one of my family. That's not quite how it's worded, but that you are my disciples, he said, because of the love you show. What is the common, binding, single, central characteristic of a church family? It needs to be love. And I suggest to you that it needs to be in our earthly families as well. That bonding, single, identifying characteristic, love. So, we can't always control how other people behave, right kids? <clears throat> but we can control, or we at least have management to some extent, over how we can behave. How we... Now, as I think about that, it brings me back to love. As much as lies within me and in within you, let us share the love of God with one another. Whether it be in our spiritual family, our church family, or in our earthly families as well. Let us share the love of Christ. Amen?
Amen. Lord, just bless our kids. We thank you for all of them. And we pray, Father, that you will help them to know they are loved in their own families, their earthly families, but also in our church family, that they can know that they are loved and that they are special. And really, as all of your children, no matter what age we may be, help us to love one another even as you have loved us. For in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our mission focus today, before we enter into our prayer time, is on our mission work in uh, Sweden. I don't know if you were aware or not that we have uh, assigned missionary family who have been serving in Sweden for, oh, I know it's been over 20 years uh, now. Doug and Anna Katrina Mogard are there. Doug was a pastor in our Allegheny region. Uh, and as you might guess, by the name Mogard, the family originally came to the United States from Sweden. I think it was his grandparents. But anyway, um, their desire was to go back and to share the gospel ministry there in Sweden. And so that's what they've done. So over these past years, he's been involved in training leaders and uh, just evangelizing there uh, in Gothenburg in uh, Sweden. Uh, so part of your mission support through the General Conference helps that mission work uh, there in, in Sweden. And it's, um, it's a hard place to minister in its own way uh, because of the uh, secularism uh, that is so prevalent. There are very few uh, very active Christians that are involved there. The percentage is very low. But anyway, uh, it's a challenge, but the gospel is needed there. And I know Doug and Anna would appreciate your prayers as you think about them. Our scripture today is to be found in the book of Ephesians, the second part of the second chapter is where we will be focused today, beginning with verse 11, Ephesians 2, 11. So we will read the uh, text beginning there, and I invite you, as you may be able or as you may choose, uh, to stand for the reading of God's word. Ephesians 2, 11 to the end of the chapter. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law and the commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens and God, with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We conclude our reading of God's word. You may be seated. As I said, we've been working our way into the book of Ephesians, and the beginning of the Ephesians, the first three chapters, Paul gives you a lot of theological insight, and we're still in that part right now. When we get to the latter three chapters, it'll become very practical and down to everyday living kind of issues based upon the standing that we have in Christ. So far, we have talked about the ideas about how all who are in Christ, God has fully and completely redeemed. And he has given us a new way of living in giving us the Holy Spirit, enabling us to serve him and follow his leading. So this new life in Christ is ours through Christ Jesus. And last week, we talked about how this new life comes about. And that is basically through God's grace. And you remember we talked about this, God's righteousness at Christ's expense, summarizing the word grace, and that through that he has shown us mercy by uh, not giving us what we should get, 
but rather giving us his wonderful love to us uh, so that we have received what we didn't deserve. He has given us the hope that is in Christ for us. This passage today basically is focusing on the idea that God has brought together the Jewish people and the promises given to them and the Gentile people who were outside of those promises and he has brought them together and he has created now in them through Christ Jesus one body, one entity, that there is only one name under heaven given by men, among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. That in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Greek anymore but we are all one in Christ. And that's what Paul is emphasizing in this passage. He's talking to a Gentile audience there at Ephesus uh, as he's writing to them and um, he's basically telling them you were once orphans, you were once without a family, you were once outside of the kingdom of God, you had no citizenship, you had no rights, you were, you were lost, you were in a desperate place. We might not like to think of ourselves like that, but in spiritual terms, that's where all of us were at one point before we came to know Jesus Christ, before we were welcomed or born again, as a phrase we use, born again into the family of God, so that we find in Christ that hope that is ours, that we are now part of God's family, and we are his children. He has made us his children through Jesus Christ who demonstrated his love for us. You know, uh, I don't know if this is part of your family story or not, but my parents were both orphaned uh, in their youth. Uh, my mother lost her mother. In fact, she was in bed with her mother the night that her mother passed, and my mother all her life long testified that she saw the angel who came to take my mother away, uh, take her mother away. Uh, and so she always bore that witness that she had ex had that experience. But then their family broke up. After mom died, the family broke up, and my uh, mother went to live with a sister. And so she was orphaned at a very early age. My father, his dad died in the pandemic of 1918. Um, and when the father died, who was the wage earner, guess what happened to their family? Their family was all broken up, and the kids were scattered. Uh, his mother was able, because my dad was the youngest one of the four, she was able to keep him at home, but I think part of the reason was he wasn't quite old enough yet to go to the orphanage, okay? At that point in time, he would have been three years old. So she kept him for a few years, but before long, he too followed his two sisters and his brothers to Scotland School for Orphans Children. And so that's where he finished his youth and his education. Both my children, uh, both my parents were orphaned, as I said. I can't begin to know what that must be like, but I remember some of their stories. I remember some of the things that they shared uh, and talked about. To be orphaned is to be alone. To be orphaned is not to have someone there providing for you. Uh, to be dependent upon someone else and perhaps not even knowing where your future is. It is to be almost like having your hope and your context of love being ripped from you. That's what Paul is saying our life was like outside of Christ before God provided for us. We had no hope. In fact, he uses that phrase. We had no promise of a better future. In fact, we were so involved in our worldly ways of life, we didn't even realize that we were in such dire condition. And yet, as Paul writes in another place, Christ died for us when we were in that situation. I think, as if you've been a Christian for any length of time, it's so easy to forget what it was like before you knew Christ. And there may be some that so early they came to Christ that they really never really had that experience out there in the world. Because I know many people have been come to faith in Christ from the time they were children. And blessed are they that they never had to experience any of those sense of being an orphan or being lost out there in the world. But Paul is making the point for all of us, because no matter what age or no matter what our experience, without Christ, that's who we are. We are orphans. We are lost. We are without hope. We are without promise. We are outside the promise. 
We are caught up in the world and the ways of the world and the powers of the world. But Paul reminds the Ephesians in verse 13, he says, but now. We're not there anymore. Now you are in Christ. That may have been where you were, but you are not there now. I'll tell you what, that is a wonderful promise. I might have been over here, an orphan. I might have been over here, lost, captured by sin, no hope, no promise, not sure where my life was going in life or in eternity. I might have been there, but now. Isn't that a wonderful thing? But now, you are in Christ. So now you have hope. Now you have purpose. Now you understand life in a new way and enables you to live it more effectively. But now we have been adopted into God's family. Yep, God has adopted us. Uh, I've read lots of stories about uh, orphan children. Uh, you maybe have read some of them. Uh, I remember one in particular about a, a little girl, uh, and she uh, felt like nobody wanted her. Because time after time, when adoption opportunities came along, the families always chose someone else, someone else. And as she got older, she began to think that it must be because she was ugly. It must be because she was uh, something wrong with her. Um, you know, she began to think about herself uh, in very negative sorts of ways. But guess what? Along came an older couple, and they adopted her. She was in her early teens at the time, but probably for 10 years she had been passed over many times. What must it be like to be passed over? To think of yourself as no good, nobody loves you, nobody wants you. But then to experience the love of a family and just to know the joy that is a part of it. I don't know if you're familiar with these stories. My girls, when they were young, loved the Anne of Green Gables stories. Anybody out there familiar with Anne of Green Gables? Well, they're wonderful stories. You, you, should, uh, you should read them. You should, you should look into them. It's about an orphan girl who's adopted by an older couple and how she uh, makes her way there and her own way, uh, and, but ultimately finds their love and they find her love. And just the beauty of what it is as they become a family. As I shared with the kids, what is it that characterizes a family? It's love. That's what needs to be there. Sadly, many of us have not had that experience. Or that love has been rejected or refused. But don't lose heart. Know that the love of God is constant and sure. And let that love of God be in your heart and know that you are his child and that you are loved, okay? Doesn't matter how big your nose is. It doesn't matter anything about you. He loves you just as you are. That is the beauty of the love in the family of God. And know that as that love from God can fill in you, fill your heart, that that love can flow from you. And perhaps, perhaps the love that is not as you might wish it could be in your family, it might find a place of healing as the love of God works in and through you and then flows over and overflows into the lives of your family. Yes, there is great hope for those who have been adopted into God's family. Jesus is the one who made it possible. He's the one, it says in this passage, who has made our peace. Our peace with God, yes. But also has made it possible for peace between us. That in the family of God, we can find love among each other as we share in the good news of Jesus Christ. As it says there, is it about verse 14? It's a very beautiful picture, actually. Uh, yes, it's in verse 14. He is made of the two one. Now, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles and how he, he's brought them all into one family. But the idea of what Jesus can do, how he can make us one, it's a beautiful picture. It has Jew and Gentile imagery here from Ephesians, but I think it also has, even in our broken human relationships, how Jesus can bring healing into those broken relationships of the two who perhaps were at enmity at one time, as Jews and Gentiles were, he can bring them together and make them in one body. But look at the picture he gives. He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What is Paul talking about there in the 14th verse? The image of the temple is in view here. 
In the Jewish temple, as you may know, and in the back of your Bible there may be a map of it, there was a large compound area, and the outer area was known as the court of the Gentiles. So Gentiles could gather there in the temple, and they could worship God there, but there was a wall of division uh, that only the Jews could uh, go into the inner court. Um, that's where the Jewish people could go to worship, but Gentiles were not allowed. Actually, and this was in Herod's temple, and the archaeologists have found parts of these plaques along the wall uh, carved in stone were uh, no Gentiles beyond this point on pain of death. There were plaques on the wall that said, you are not allowed to come in, to the, you cannot come in to the place where there is sacrifice, where the lambs are slain and where forgiveness of sins is to be found. You have to stand back you are aliens, you are foreigners, you do not belong inside the house of God, okay? You can only look in. You can't go in. That's what those signs were all about. And Paul says right here, Jesus has torn that wall down. All people, Jew and Gentile, all people are welcome to come into the house of God all the way to the altar of sacrifice, which is the cross, where the lambs were slain, where the Lamb of God was slain. All are welcome to come to the foot of the cross and there find forgiveness and hope, find a certain future, find confidence and help and all the things that Jesus can offer to them. He, Jesus, has torn down this wall of separation and division. And in fact, as Paul goes on in this passage, he says that you are now members of God's family, God's household, and as a matter of fact, Jesus becomes the cornerstone. What is a cornerstone? A cornerstone is set so that the two walls that project off of it, and ultimately all the walls, all the lines can be made straight. So you have this idea of the two have been made one. The two, the Jew and Gentile, they are brought together at this cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. He is the one who sets all things right. That's what Paul is saying here to his Ephesian friends and announcing also to the Jewish nation that Jesus is this building marker from which everything is determined and set and all the lines can be straight. He goes on to talk about in this passage how through Jesus and his cross he has done this and that Jesus is the only way. He is the one who brings peace for all people and it is done through his cross. There is no more hostility, no more separation, but all are one in Christ. In the family of God, all receive the love of God the same. There's a story of a, uh, a, a woman who had, I forget, it was like 14 or 15 children. Um, and anyway, uh, she was asked one time, uh, all these children, um, which one do you love the most? Do you know what her answer was? The one who needs it most. I thought that's pretty profound. She loves them all equally, but there are times when some need a little more loving in that moment and in that time because of the circumstances or situations. I think that's not a bad picture of how God loves us. He loves us all equally as his children. But there are times when life gets tough. And in those tough moments, the love of God through Jesus Christ is very especially yours. His love just surrounds you because you need it most right then. That is a wonderful experience to know the love of God and that he is there for us in our most trying times as well as in all the good times as well. We are God's holy temple. This passage announces, Paul writes to the Ephesians, he's saying we are united as God's temple in one and as God's temple, we basically have God's presence in us, through us, with us, all around us, we are this holy temple set apart for God's service. The imagery of the Holy Spirit that is given here is like the Old Testament tabernacle or even the temple uh, where the presence of God was seen either in the, the cloud of smoke or whatever uh, that was lifted up from the tabernacle or the temple or when the fire of God came and settled down. It's the Holy Spirit who dwells within us to give us the assurance of this love of God. How do you know God loves you? First, you have the cross. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Second of all, you have the blessing of God's Holy Spirit. And that is he has given you his inner witness that you can know in your heart, within your soul, you can know that you are God's child and that you can have every confidence that the promise of God's love will never be taken away and that they are yours all the time. And then you have something else, something we forget. You have each other. You have each other. You have the love of God manifest in the family of God. You are the body of Christ, if you will. That's the body he talks about in this passage. He brought the two and made of them one body. That is the church. And so that the love of Christ in the body of Christ, that is a wonderful blessing and assurance. Now, I'm going to look at this only from the one side. And that's the side of how I need to demonstrate the love of God. For me, there is the challenge. Demonstrating God's love to my brothers and sisters in Christ, especially when they have not been lovely towards me. My call is not to complain about the fact that my family doesn't love me as they ought to. Rather, my call is to love my family as I ought to. Am I making sense? In other words, it's not as much about receiving love as it is giving love. It is more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus said. So our call as the family of God is to love on each other and to do it often and as much as we can. Who knows who needs it most today? But if we are reaching out in love to one another and caring for one another, then the love of Christ will certainly be available to all who need it as they need it. You have the cross. You have the Holy Spirit. But you have one another. Paul's writing to the church here to tell them that they are members of God's family and that they should enjoy and celebrate the fact that God loves them but that they also have a community that loves them as well. Now, as we think about this love in the family of God, we have a responsibility locally. We have a responsibility globally. We have a responsibility both physical and spiritual. Our friend, the train. <laughs> So as I started with the kids, what is the mark of a good, healthy family? It's one that loves, right? And that is the mark of a good, healthy congregation too. One that loves. For we are one in purpose, we are one in love. So, are you a member of God's family? I trust that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. I trust that you know his forgiveness. I trust that you know his peace. I trust that you know his love. For his love is a gift for this life and for eternity. But like any gift, it's one you had to receive. It's one that is offered, but you need to receive it. I trust that you have. But if you have not, know this. It's very simple. If you come to Jesus... He will gladly welcome you into his family. If you read in the scriptures, I don't know that he ever turned away anyone who came to him. It says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's very simple, friends. To be part of the family of God is just to turn to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I love you and I want to serve you. It's that simple, my friends, to walk with Jesus. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the family of God, for our, for our family in Christ. Lord, it is just good to know the love of the body of Christ. I know, Lord, that it's not always consistent, and sometimes it fails us. But, Lord, I know that the love is there. And we are family. Nothing changes that. We are family in you. 
but help us to be loving people. Help us to share your love as you have shown it to us freely and fully, to share it with those around. For there are many who need your love and many who need your touch. And the only way they will experience it is as we share it. So we give you thanks for our new life in Christ. We give you thanks for our new family. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that in our church family, we can be one in Christ and one in each other. And we pray that you will be glorified and that the love of Jesus will abound more and more. For in his name we pray. Amen. I hope that you have brought your communion elements with you today. And out there, you may be watching. If you have uh, your elements at home, now would be the time to get them ready. How did Christ demonstrate his love? The cross, my friends, the cross. That he went there to die for us. For the Lamb of God sacrificed himself there freely for you and for me. There he shed his blood and suffered the agony of a physical death. There he testified to the fact that he loved us. Greater love has no man than this, Jesus himself said, than that he would lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you, he said. He commanded us to do this in remembrance of him. So let us be obedient. Let us show ourselves to be the friends of Christ by sharing his love with one another and with all whom we meet. Jesus was gathered in the upper room with his disciples. He took the bread and he blessed it before he distributed it to his disciples. So we will pause for a moment of prayer and ask God's blessing. Lord, we give you thanks for this bread, which is representation of the body of Christ. And we know that this bread was only produced by the crushing of the grains of wheat. And we know, Lord, that the bread of life was only provided for us by his being crushed upon the cross by the shedding of his blood. We give you thanks for Christ's willingness to go to that cross for us, that we might be part of your family, O oh God. For in his name we pray. Amen. The scripture says that he, after blessing the bread, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. similar manner after supper Jesus took the cup he blessed it and gave to his disciples so we will pray God's blessing father we thank you for this cup which represents the blood of Christ poured out for us and we thank you for his willingness to shed his blood for without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin so the scripture says we give you thanks Lord that he is the final sacrifice that in his shedding of blood he abolished all that, that which went before and gives us the hope of eternal life. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. He said, this cup is the new agreement that is made in my blood, which is poured out for the remission of many persons' sin. As often as you drink of it, he said, remember me. Let's close in prayer. Truly, Father, it is good to be part of a family, a family where there is plenty of love to go around. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for your family, which you have invited us into through Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for brothers and sisters who love and care. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can come together in worship to glorify you and to lift up the name of Jesus. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we go forth from here, that that love rests and abide upon, abides upon each one. Help us, Heavenly Father, to share that love more and more with one another and with those around in our community, whether they be alien or stranger, friend or family, 
Let the love of God flow from us, Heavenly Father, so that all may know that Jesus, Jesus, is King of kings and Lord of lords. For unto him is all glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and evermore. And together we say, Amen. 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 Remember this, my friends. God loves you. God loves you completely. Share his love anywhere you can and with anyone you can. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.